But I got so low that, um, and I did, I was in the Priory for a little while mm -hmm. and I tried different, mm -hmm. different therapies there, but mm. nothing really sort of clicked or worked for me. And I remember mm. I spent quite a lot of time going, I just want someone to fix me. I just want yeah. someone to fix my brain. And it felt like nothing was working. And my mum, I think, came across this guy in a magazine or something like that. Um, and he happened to live 40 minutes from us in Scotland and he'd written a book about um, NLP. Mm -hmm. So we just thought, you know, we'll just go and, we'll go and give it a go. Mm -hmm. And it's very much, they get you into a really sort of relaxed state, take you through your, your life, basically, stopping at any flags of emotion. And yeah. I just felt different. It was like something had just changed. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm Dr. Sherry Jacobson, and this is Therapy Lab, a podcast dedicated to demystifying therapy, mental health, and the art of well being. In this episode, we are joined by TV presenter Dani Menzies to talk about her personal experiences. Welcome to Therapy Lab. Hello, Dani. Hi. Thank <laughs> you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. How are you doing? I am really good, yeah, I'm good. I've had a really nice day, got my sister down visiting, so I've been out walking my dog and enjoying the weekend. Okay, tell us a little bit about what you are, who you are and what you do. So I, I work in television. I've been doing a show called A Place in the Sun for about four years, so I travel quite a lot with that. Um, I am from Scotland and I've lived in London for about eight years with my little Jack Russell dog, who's the love of my life. And very Instagrammable. Yes, she's got her own Instagram, Kinky Pants Menzies. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've, I guess I enjoy hanging out with friends. I'm quite mm. social now in London. Um, I like travelling and yeah, I work, I work quite a lot. So I'm, a, I'm away travelling a lot, basically. Mm. <laughs> so we spoke about this before, but I'll ask you again. How did you get into A Place in the Sun? So... It was, it's, it's quite a long story, but I'll try and condense it. So I studied textiles at university um, and I, I had an accident, um, which I, I smashed my face in a little bit and it was quite, quite tough. Couldn't really see properly for about a month, I think. And then around the same sort of time, a boy who had sort of been my childhood sweetheart passed away um, out of nowhere, just didn't wake up one day. And those two things sort of um, triggered something within me, which led me to, to dropping out and moving back home to Scotland, um, where I started working with horses, which had always been something that I'd done since a really young age. And I found very therapeutic. I got rescue horses that had come from meat factories in Hungary, rehabilitated them, retrained mm -hmm. them and ended up starting a little business there. So that was really fabulous for me because it meant I had to go outside every day and work with them. But it also meant that I kind of, yeah, well, it was therapy in a way for me. Mm -hmm. um, but it also kind of changed how I looked physically at the time. And then I got picked up for modeling, which was, which was a bit um, out of the blue and a surprise for me. I didn't actually really want to do the shoot when they asked me, my best friend, really wanted to be a stylist. So she was like, you're doing it. So that led me to start modeling. And then I didn't, I was in the industry for a while, but I didn't love it, especially the fashion side of it. And I think back then there was quite a lot more pressure on um, being s slimmer. Now the industry I think has grown and is a, is a lot different, but yeah, I was hungry <laughs> and I didn't make very much money. And mm -hmm. I had this, voice of my auntie ringing in my head saying you'd make a great presenter so I started mm. working for free in the evenings interviewing different people mm. and through time sort of built up experience in a showreel and just as I was about to sack it all in because I wasn't getting my big break I got my big break so then it, then mm. it kind of happened so really mm. I think with the presenting it was very much persistence, a bit of luck, timing, and mm. yeah, then it, then it just happened. And then how often do you do it? Like, and what are these sort of spells of, of work? So throughout the year, last year, I think I spent um, probably half of the year abroad. 
filming, mm. but it's broken up into different blocks. So I'm about to go away for two weeks, then I'm back for a week, mm. then I'm away for a week, then I'm back for two weeks. So it's, it mm. just varies. I'm kind of in and out of London all the time. Mm. And um, yeah, on the go a lot. And how are you with that, with that coming and going? Um, I am okay with that. It's been, mm. I've been doing it for about four and a half years now. Um, and at the beginning, I very much was very anxious about what I was doing because I was completely out of my depth and out of my mm. comfort zone. And um, that was really scary. Now I'm really relaxed with the work side of it. Mm. Um, and I can really enjoy that. But it can be difficult living your life, not being able to do certain things you know it's very hard to start a relationship for example yeah. when yeah. you sort of go on three or four dates and then you go okay see you later and then you come back and they find someone else <laughs> or whatever you know it's, it can be a little bit tough that part yeah. and I definitely miss my dog lots when I'm away as yeah. well but yeah. I also find that it can be quite a nice London's so fast paced mm -hmm. so I also find that although when I travel, I'm going away for work, I still can relax a little bit mm -hmm. because there's not, there's not as much, there's not as many distractions, there's not that fast paced feeling that you have when you're in London. Mm. It's just sort of one thing to focus on when mm. you're away, which is quite good, quite good for me, I think. And so what's a typical day like for you, either when you're in Spain out there or, or when you're here? Um, when I'm here, it, it really varies because I'll be doing different meetings I, and they could be here, they could be in Scotland, I could be doing mm. voiceover. So while I'm in London, no day's the same really, but I do try to keep some mm. things that are consistent. Like I have my little morning rituals um, and mm. I try to exercise most days. So they're my definites mm. and walk the dog. And then aside mm. from that, it can, all, it can all be very different. And then mm. when I'm in Spain, it's very much up at six, do my little morning rituals, and then we'll, we can be filming, we can be leaving at seven and not getting back till 7 p.m. some days. So they're quite long, long busy days and you're very switched on the whole time. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, so it can be quite busy. Can you describe to us what your morning ritual entails? Yes, so I try to do six different things. And this is qu quite new for me. Originally, I, I mean, I've always sort of done, tried to do a bit of yoga or meditating in the morning. Um, but I read a book recently called The Miracle Morning, um, which I loved. I just loved the idea of, I've got quite a short attention span, so mm -hmm. loved the idea of breaking it down into six different things. So I meditate for 10 minutes. I'll do 10 minutes of yoga. I'll do 10 minutes of saying affirmations to myself. I'll do 10 minutes of visualising and I'll do 10 minutes of reading and 10 minutes of writing. Sounds absolutely wonderful. Yeah, what 10 a, minutes what is... a package. Yeah, wow. and it's not that long, but actually, if you think about it, if you re read for 10 minutes every morning, throughout a year, that can amount to 12, 13, 14 books. Depends how quickly you read, I guess, but yeah. So actually, mm. that's a lot of knowledge that, mm. yeah. And what books do you tend to choose? I quite like a self-help book. Ever since I sort of started suffering with anxiety and things about um, 10 or so years ago, I really got into self-help books. And some of them are quite, some of them might be a bit cheesy, but I just love them. Mm. I just think, you know, like the, the Miracle Morning I thought was great. Mm. And I like trying out the different things. And I find that even if not some of the book, you know, doesn't really suit you. You might be reading it and thinking, oh, for goodness sake, there'll be mm. something you can get out of all of them. Mm. Like I really liked when I read The Secret, I've, ever since then, I've made a vision board every year. Um, and I just find that they, they really help me focus on stuff. The first year I ever made a vision board, I put it up in my room and I looked at it and looked and looked at it and I put it under my bed one day, I think, because I was embarrassed because I got a new boyfriend, didn't want him to see what was on it. And I took it out from under my bed about a year later. And honestly, something had happened that was connected to every single thing that I put on there, down to the exact amount of money that I wanted to make. I made it exactly that amount. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Really cool. I think they're amazing. Yeah. And then for some reason, yeah. I didn't do them for three or four years. And in January, I was like, why have I not, mm. why have I not been doing mm. that? 
So I made another one this year. So uh, I, I, I haven't done one before. How would you start and, and what, what do you need to create an effective one? I mean, you don't really need anything. You can, you can just put pictures on a door if you want. Mm. But I've got a cork board and I usually buy a bunch of magazines um, and, and really just have a think about certain areas of my life, you know. Mm. Where would I like to be living at some point in the nearest future? Or where would I like to travel to this year? That one I always do. Take um, cut out a couple of pictures of places I want to go and make sure they're up there. Um, I also, if there's things that I, I should mm. be doing, I try and sort of make a note of them on there as well. Mm. Um, and, I mean, once I, I cut out a picture of a women's figure on Women's Health magazine and I got booked to shoot for Women's Health about three weeks wow. later and I was like, oh, this is amazing. But um, yeah, mm. so it's just really anything, anything that you want in your life mm. in the near future, whether it's, you know, how you want to see yourself, places you want to go, things you want to achieve. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> And did you like? Did you ever have an idea when you were younger, growing up, that that's what you wanted to do later on, or is no. complete contrast to how you grew up? I, yeah, I mean, I didn't. Don't think I really ever knew what I wanted. I, mm. I changed my mind quite a lot. I wanted to be mm. an architect, then I wanted to be a vet, then I realized I wasn't going to get the grades to be a vet. I always had things that I loved: mm. animals, travel. But I never, I never quite knew exactly what it was I wanted. And I think when I decided I wanted to do presenting, it was very much, if I present, I can do all of the things that I like. You know, I can tap into them all at some point. Mm. I don't need to just pick one thing. And I think that was sort of the mindset behind it. Yeah. And you spoke about anxiety and emotional difficulties later on. Were there any signs of it in your early childhood? Um, I was bullied quite badly when I was, when I was a young teenager from probably from the age of about 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I definitely had, would get that looking back now, I know that that, that sort of anxious fear. Um, but actually even that it very much, it, I think it kind of made me like, I wouldn't change any of that part because mm -hmm. It taught me to be strong, you know, mum and dad always saying, don't let them see you cry. And now, you know, if someone's really, these things really shape you, I think. So although there mm. was things like that that went on in my life, I don't think there was any sort of major signs of, uh, mm. when I was younger, really. Mm. So when it appeared later on or when, when symptoms developed later on, did they take you by surprise? And what, what did it look like for you? Yeah, I mean, I had no idea what was wrong with me. I, mm. I, mental health was not something I'd ever talked about or knew anything about. I didn't, I had no idea. So um, I actually thought I had a virus for about a month. And every time I tried to go outside, I would get so sweaty and I'd instantly need to run to the toilet or think mm. I was going to be sick and... Now, looking back, I know it was sort of anxious and pa panic. and but, um, mm. but at the time, I just thought I was ill. I remember going to the doctor's surgery and I drove there in my little Renault Clio and um, I had a chat with this doctor and he sort of said, yeah, you've, you've probably caught a virus, so it'll, it'll clear up. Right. And on the way home, mm. I was sitting, sitting in my car and I pulled up traffic lights and I felt this like overwhelming you know, heart racing, I couldn't breathe, I was sweating. And I, I passed out and I woke up someone tooting, tooting their horn behind me. And then I was even more scared because I was like, this, what is going on here? Um, and I just, I didn't understand it for a very long time. I think it actually took probably, it's, it's funny because that time of my life is almost like a little bit blurry, the timing of things. Um, but I think mm. it probably took sort of, three or four months for, for me to realise and for someone to say to me, I think that this is a mental thing. Mm -hmm. um, just had no idea. And I don't think people talked about it as much then mm. either. So it took quite a lot for, for someone to get to that. But yeah, it took a long time. <laughs> and what did you do then? I tried lots of different things. Mm -hmm. I, 
not being able to go out. I was a very sociable girl at university. I was out every single night. I did, you know, I had loads of friends. I did all loads of activities. And then to not go outside anymore mm. um, and not be social anymore, I went back home and I became really, really depressed about it. So just to backtrack for a bit, mm. you became agoraphobic, would you say? Yeah, yeah. So it was agoraphobia. Diagnosed or sort of understood through your own reading and research? Um, yeah, probably more through my own reading and research. Mm. No one ever actually... Maybe they did. Maybe they did say. But I don't remember anyone ever saying mm. to me, that's mm. that, that's what it is. But, but I you mean, found it very difficult to be in, in spaces where, with crowds? Oh, yeah, the world would completely cave in on me. Like, it would go black. And I would... I, I was taking... For me to go outside at one point, I was, taking, I was on 30 milligrams of diazepam a day. And I was you know, like walking against the wall could hardly hold my head up. And that was just for me to get outside and get in the car. And as soon as I was in the car, I was lying down. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was really, I, was, I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> a normal human being when I went outside, I had to be drugged up basically. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle going outside. So I, I mean, that's what it is, isn't it? Mm. Um, and yeah, that just, it made me feel very, very depressed. And getting the horses really helped with that because nobody in my family does horses. So if I didn't go out and look after them, nobody else was going to. And it was in the countryside and I'd mm. been there my whole life. So it was a bit more comfortable. So I'd managed mm. to go out and do that every day. So that was a real helpful thing in, on my journey to get me outside and doing something I had to do every day. Um, yeah, that that helped a lot. Mm. <laughs> and was was that? I mean, did, so so would you say sort of anxiety and depression became manageable for you later on? And to what extent does it bubble up from time to time? So later on, so getting getting. Uh, do you mean now does it bubble up ever? Mm. Occasionally, I can feel a bit anxious about mm. situations, and but I but nothing. I would I think because I felt so low, mm. I've worked really hard to get where I am and how I feel. I would never feel that way really again. I can feel it bubble up a little bit, but I'm aware of what it is. Mm. I know what it is. I know what to do to make myself feel better. You know whether it's go for a run, go for a walk, speak to someone. I can very mm. quickly get myself out of it and into a good place. And yeah. the depression side of it, I, everyone can have a down day. Yeah. But I think once I used to have a down day and go in on it and it would last days and then weeks. Whereas now I go, cool, I'm having a day where I should just watch the telly and not do anything, mm. put a face mask on <laughs> mm. and just ride it out. I'll be fine tomorrow. Mm. And, and mm. so, yeah, I can feel it a little bit, but by no means does it consume me like it mm. used to. Did you spend time abroad? Did you travel? Did you, was there anything else along your healing journey? Yeah, I mean, it sounds really a bit weird, but um, so after I did um, timeline therapy, I- Which we will get to. Oh, sorry. No, that's fine. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so yeah. after I did that, it, it, um, I kind of, had this dramatic shift where I had got so low that I was like, my life is over. I didn't want to live anymore. And when I suddenly felt that weight lifted, I, I had this shift in my mindset where I was like, well, wait a minute, if I'm gonna be here and I'm gonna live and I'm not gonna die, I might as well, I'm not scared to, nothing's gonna make me feel as bad as how I felt. I'm not scared to do things that really push myself. So that's when I started doing the modeling stuff and went away from the countryside. And when I got to Edinburgh, I was there for, for a while. And um, I, I thought, you know what? I just want to, I really want to give this a go. I want to move to London. I want to try and do all these things and it's not going to kill me, I'll be fine. Um, but physically I still had the panic attacks and anxiety and although mentally I wanted to go and do it, it was like a physically, my body wasn't 
caught up with me. I, I don't know. So I'd try and do things and I'd find myself having to lie on a floor next to a bus stop before I got on the bus because I'd be feeling like I was going to pass out so wow. badly. Wow. So then I was like, do you know what? I just need to, I just need to push myself. So I really wanted to move to London. I thought, where's the, where's the scariest place I can think of? So I went to Mexico City on my own, which I know sounds really <laughs> mental. I don't know what I was thinking actually, but I thought if I can survive that, then London will be easy. And I went there and I mean, you can't write the things that happened while I was there. It was, Me Mexico City is not a safe place for a tall blonde woman. <laughs> it was mm. mental. Um, and I was actually in quite dangerous situations a few times and I was really scared. And the, the last night that I was there, I came home with the girl I was sharing a flat with and we had these big bolts on our bedroom doors and the bolts had been removed from our bedroom doors and the bathroom window was open and she had a nice camera that was still sitting on the bed. And we were like, okay, so they've come mm. in here, <laughs> they've taken the bolts off our bedroom doors, they've not taken the camera, it's us that, you know, that they want. So we were terrified and she spoke to her mum and her mum went, go and stay with these people and she just left me. So I pushed my sofa up against the front door of an apartment and sat with my bags packed and a pair of scissors in my hand because I thought if they come, I'll put up a good fight. Mm -hmm. And I waited until it got light outside and then I changed my flight, which luckily only cost 20 pounds, would you believe, and got on a plane back to the UK. And within three days, I was on a train to London and it totally worked. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, although it was yeah. terrifying, yeah. Nobody spoke English. I had nothing. I had no one. I was in these mm. scary situations. and But I managed it and I survived it. And I just thought, well, if I can get to London, you know, at least if I'm, something happens to me, I pass out on a train because I have a panic attack, I can speak to them at least. Whereas in Mexico, mm. it was just you're, you're on your own. So putting yourself in a very challenging spot had managed to shift something in you, something about your abilities to be able to... Yeah get through other situations. A hundred percent. It complete. It, it mm. took a lot of it away, to be honest. And it's mm. not that I came here and I never got them. It was almost like a bit of a gradual process. I still had anxiety yeah. and I still got panic attacks, but it's almost like I wasn't as scared of them anymore and I, I could manage them better and they did mm. become less and less. Yeah. yeah. So that, I guess, combined with the, the therapy that you'd had before, can you talk us through that? How did you know to, to seek out the kind of therapy? What did, it, what did it entail as well? It was very much, um, we were just looking, I was just trying different things. Yeah. So I got so low that, um, and I did, I was in the Priory for a little while mm -hmm. and I tried different, mm -hmm. different therapies there, but mm -hmm. nothing really sort of clicked or worked for me. And I remember, mm -hmm spent quite a lot of time going, I just want someone to fix me. I just want yeah. someone to fix my brain. It felt like nothing was working. And my mum, I think, came across this guy in a magazine or something like that. Um, and he happened to live 40 minutes from us in Scotland and he'd written a book about um, NLP. Mm -hmm. So we just thought, you know, we'll just go and, we'll go and give it a go. Mm. And I think I had two sessions, but I remember the first one going in and chatting and it's very much they get you into a really sort of relaxed state take you through your your life basically stopping at any flags of emotion going down into that that situation and that time and taking the best way I can describe it is just taking the feelings away yeah. um so there was quite a few things in my life that we stopped at we went into and it was just like a weight had been lifted off mm. my shoulders and when I went away, mm. I, I think I slept for like, pretty much slept for like two or three days afterwards, honestly. Mm. And mm. I just felt different. It was like something had just changed. Mm. Literally like, I, I think people should do it like yearly, wow. <laughs> almost, you know? Because yeah. when you're making all these decisions in day-to-day -day life, you're making yeah. them based on everything that's sitting here, aren't you? And it's almost like a fresh yeah. start. So yeah, I found it, I found it really amazing. Um, so how many sessions total? Just the two? Yeah. Just two sessions. And you call it, so NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. I've not tried it myself. You refer to it as timeline therapy because it went through different junctures of, of your life. Yeah, yeah, very much. And, and to be honest, I don't know very much 
uh, else about mm. it. It's just that was just the one thing that I happened to try, and mm. there were other other things that I tried with different doctors, but that was the thing that just changed everything. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Therapy Lab. If you feel ready to transform your life with therapy, we're offering 10% off a first session with any therapist on harleytherapy.com to our listeners. Just use the code THERAPYLAB when you book your session on harleytherapy.com. And what's your view about like people accessing help and um, in, in general, kind of, do you feel that things are shifting in terms of the stigma? Because you're talking very openly about mm. your ex early experiences. Do you get the impression that it, it's more it's sort of acceptable and... and, and yeah, a hundred percent. I think it's, it's interesting because I think it's much more acceptable to talk about it. Mm. Sometimes it's almost... Uh, it's tricky because... I think it's shifted. People talk about it a lot more, which is fantastic mm. and it's great. But there's also a lot more pressures than there's ever been for younger people, you know, in Scram, all that sort of thing, yeah. which means that mm. sometimes it can almost, I think people maybe almost throw away it, the, the different terms too much, you know, mm -hmm. oh, I'm mm -hmm. suffering really badly with this and they don't actually know what, what that is. I don't know if that's a bad yeah. thing to say, but... It's almost, yeah. we do talk about it. But maybe too flippantly. Yeah, right? sometimes. Mm. And I think it's great mm. that there's less stigma, stigma and maybe even if it is a bit flippantly, at least then you can learn. Mm. Um, however, I think with more, with some mental health illnesses, it's, there's still a lot of stigma and it's mm -hmm. still not talked about enough. I've got a brother who's schizophrenic mm. and um, mm. there's still a lot, of progress that can be made with illnesses like mm. that where we learn more mm. about them talk more about them and for mm. there to be more help actually available mm. what's your experience of of having a relative with schizophrenia what's it like for you um it's hard it's mm. really hard yeah mm. it's um it's hard because you want you just want them to get all the help that they can get and I think our family's experience is that there's not a lot of support or help mm. and knowledge on the best things to do. Um, mm. So it can be very difficult. Mm. And I want to just get back for a bit because we're talking about reducing stigma and I wondered what your experiences are of like mental health and issues generally in the TV industry because you know, it's it's quite, mm. my impression is very intensive and lots of tight deadlines and also uh, presentation based, okay. um, so the sort of aesthetic quality as well and being composed. Any, any, any impressions as to whether the stigma is kind of lessening there and to the same extent or are there still expectations to be always on your best form? Yeah, it's funny. So when I first started working in television and, and modeling actually as well, mm -hmm. I very much remember someone saying to me, don't tell them that you're depressed. You won't get the job. Right. And actually, wow. I remember filling in a form where I had to check a box if I'd been depressed in the last three years. Oh. And I lied. I lied about it all the time. And it wasn't actually yeah. until probably maybe two years ago, three years ago, that I decided I would start being honest and open and talking about it. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I, I, I will always talk about now because I think yeah. that you never know. You say, you mention it to one person and that actually might be the person who you can really help because they needed to yeah. speak to someone who might understand that day or whatever. Yeah. So there used to be, it used yeah. to be really bad, I think. Yeah. Um, that in itself is terrible. But now I think that has changed quite a lot and everyone's yeah. very mindful. I mean, I've talked openly about anxiety and depression in the past and mm. you know, my bosses are really mindful of it. My, your, your representations are really mindful of it. Um, and so I think it's it's much better now, yeah. much better. Really refreshing to hear that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, no, they're great, yeah. really good. <laughs> and um, so I, I know that you're an ambassador to a number of groups. What what are the things that you're involved in? I know that you have a number of interests that are, are close to your heart. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a mad animal lover. <laughs> mm. I've always um, been, I think I first started bringing home 
animals that I'd rescued when I was about six years old and that's always been a bit of a theme. So I'm an ambassador for the Mayhew Animal Charity, mm. um, which is an amazing charity in London. They are a cat and dog home, but they do much more than that. So they have thera Therapaws, which Aww. is a programme, yeah, which is a programme where they take their dogs to elderly people, hospitals, people with different mental health issues, um, mm -hmm. and they spend time with them and the animals, which is obviously an amazing th therapy and something that definitely was a part of my life when I was struggling with the horses and whatnot. So I, lo I love that about them. Um, and I also work regularly at the soup kitchen on Tottenham Court Road. So mm. when I'm not filming and I'm in London, I try and do, I was there the day before yesterday, I think I try and do a day or two a week if I can um, and go in there. And one of the big things there is that men, you know, most people on the yes. streets have mental health issues. Yeah. So um, that's, when I first went there, I went because I noticed some of the symptoms on people that were homeless that I'd seen in my brother mm -hmm. and I, I was feeling a bit helpless or whatever so I wanted to, to go and help out and actually when I got there I was really blown away by the people and the way that they the relationships that you build up there and mm -hmm. the fact that so many of them are older people who might not have anyone and you know they might be a bit paranoid so they don't want to be on the system and so they can't they can't get the help that they that they need and they're so they're sleeping rough. So I've been doing that for about three years and um, it's a really important thing to me and I've built up really good relationships there. And you know, as hard as it can be at times when you see people deteriorate because naturally they're they're um, living a very rough life on the street, you can see them deteriorate, that's hard. You also see people make progress and that is amazing so mm. there is a guy who has been coming in there since I've well longer than me and um I saw him get really really sad and I could feel you, you see a change in people sometimes you could see mm. it in his face and that he was getting really low and I was I was losing sleep over him I was really concerned for his for his for his well-being and there's not really anything you can you can really do mm. other than go and give you time or that I could really do um, anyway, so he recently got got an opportunity um, working the job that he used to work many years ago before he came homeless mm. and now I haven't seen him since because he's working mm. and he's studying again and, you know, seeing him come mm. in with that big smile on his face and that change just by getting that little leg up by someone, yeah. it was it was amazing. So it was quite, it, that was really rewarding. It's really nice to yeah. see. Yeah. <laughs> Again, just so impressed with the amount of causes that you support and, and the heart that you throw into it. Yeah, um, and then your other passion, petrol head. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, um, yeah, that's always been a bit of a thing. I'm, I'm, I'm not the fountain of knowledge on cars, but I love driving fast. <laughs> mm, how did that develop? So when I was about, I grew up on a farm or an old farm, and when I was about uh, nine years old, my, I think my dad got fed up of running me along to the to the fields in the evenings. So he mm -hmm. taught me how to drive, um, which same age he learned to drive, nine years old, and it's just kind of what you do in the country, isn't it? So I got my first car when I was about 10. It was a Fiat Panda, which had no doors on it because they annoyed my grandpa, so he pulled them off. And um, he had put Araldite everywhere because he loved Araldite. And um, yeah, I used to rally it over the fields to go out to the, to the horses. And I think mm. that's probably where mm. it came from. By the time I was 13, I was doing donuts, donuts in the fields and going mad. And when I was about 19, 20, we would go around to the local farmers who do a demolition derby every year, which was really good fun. My mum loves driving as well, so mm. she did it too. And yeah, it's just always been a bit of a thing. So. Mm. To be honest, it helped me get my first job in tally, but I totally mm -hmm. blagged it. Mm -hmm. I told them that I was this like superstar rally champion, which was all not true. Um, but I got the job and they let me drive supercars all over the UK, so that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and do you still get to drive now? Yeah, I do. I'm actually, so this year I'm taking part in Superlap Scotland, um, which I'm really excited about because they have like 100 people 
competing in it and there are only six females so we're trying to champion getting more mm. women involved and um, they have a prize called the King of the Hill and I'm really determined to try and make it the Queen of the Hill this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that'll be quite good fun. Oh, so good. I've been getting some lessons up at the track in Scotland. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's good. It's good Brilliant. buzz. Well, you just have so many interests <laughs> and so many, like just the amount of <laughs> energy you have <laughs> to, to do all of this. Um, so where can people sort of follow you? Um, Instagram, obviously, you've got a big collection of followers. Yeah. So Danny Menzies is there. Yep, Danny Menzies on Instagram. Yep. Um, I'm on Twitter as well, although I'm not terribly good at using it. Instagram's yeah. probably the best place. And me. A Place in the Sun, when are the episodes running? We are on every day. So there's seven mm. of us doing the show and they mm. make a lot of them. Wow. Um, we literally have at least one show on every day. So yeah. I'm not sure when the new series starts. I think it'll be in the next month or so. And what station is that on? On Channel 4. On Channel 4. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Danny, for, for coming in, for sharing in so much. And, and, and really, it, you obviously, uh, just you're so in touch with your journey and, and so authentic. And I'm so pleased that you'll be able to share with everyone. No problem. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Therapy Lab. To find private, affordable therapy in person around the UK or online by video from around the world, visit harleytherapy.com today to start therapy as soon as tomorrow. If this is your first listen to Therapy Lab, do hit subscribe to keep up to date with new episodes. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, and all good platforms.